Good morning, folks. Well, afternoon, actually. It's half past 12. Welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. Um, we are tackling isomerism today. Uh, to be more specific, we're actually tackling stereoisomerism. Normal isomerism is the boring type where um, you're unplugging a carbon from one end and popping it somewhere in the middle of the chain. This is a much more technical type. It's my favourite new mug, by the way. Thank you. Joel. Uh, SQA, page 97 to 99. And we're going to tackle two different flavours of stereoisomers today, folks. Um, we're going to tackle geometric isomers and optical isomers. With no further ado, let's jump into geometric isomerism. We'll use that first sheet as a summary at the end, I think. Geometric isomers occur across a carbon-carbon double bond and also in cyclic uh, singly bonded circles. Let me show you what I'm raving about. If we had, for example, dichloroethene, so we could have a chlorine here, we could have a hydrogen here, we could have a chlorine here, and we could have a hydrogen here. That is option one. Uh, the other option, because this bond here is a double bond, uh, we now know the true nature of double bonds, by the way. If you haven't, uh, go away and have a look at my video on double bonds. The pi bond here stops this molecule from rotating. The molecule cannot rotate, which means we can have a different isomer of that. We can have dichloroeth... 1, 2, to be more exact, 1, 2, dichloroethene. Again, only this time, we can put a chlorine here and a chlorine here. These are not the same molecule. These are examples of geometric isomers, in fact. When we have the substituent on the same side of the double bond, we call this the cis isomer. So this is cis 1, 2 dichloroethene, and this is uh, trans 1, 2 dichloroethene because the two substituents are on the opposite sides. They're across the double bond. Uh, so the geometric isomers exist. This is where they happen. I did say they all would also happen in cyclics. If we were to, I, I might try and build a cycle. Excuse me, two seconds. The wonderful world of the pause button means that two seconds is no seconds. Uh, so we have cyclopentane here, and we have a dichloro one two dichloro cyclo cyclopentane again. And you can see, I'm being lazy, by the way. I know. Don't shout at me. There are hydrogens all around here. Let's just pop the two hydrogens on for here. Haha, <laughs> so I do punish you by having getting you to watch me assemble and listen to me assembling after all. No pause for that one. So, uh, one, two, dichlorocyclopentane. Uh, this would be the cis version where you can see the two chlorines are on the same side of the ring. And of course, we can swap them over to the other side. There we go. So, these would be the trans option. Now, these are only single bonds, I know, but because the cyclic structure restricts the rotation to nothing, it doesn't allow it to happen, then you can get geometric isomerism on single bonds as well as double bonds, but only when you're in a cyclic structure. As soon as you break the cyclic structure, you can have free rotation, and therefore, geometric isomers do not happen anymore. Properties. Um, the SQ wants you to know that geometric isomers are quite seriously different molecules to each other. This results in quite a few different properties. Melting and boiling points. Melting point and boiling point can be seriously different. I say seriously. A few degrees. Uh, but nevertheless, they are still measurably different because of stacking. If you imagine um, cis molecules of one, these will stack together differently compared to these. That affects the strength of the London dispersion forces and therefore will change your melting and boiling points. Uh, they also want you to know that the chemical differences, there's chemical properties, so sorry, that's physical properties, can be quite different. And chemical properties can also be different. You can get different chemical reactions. We're not going to go into any examples of that because you're not required to know them. But yet chemical properties can also be different in, in geometric isomers. Sorry, should not try and think ahead. So okay, physically different, chemically different for geometric isomers. Let's move along to optical isomers now, our second flavour of stereoisomer. This is a fascinating field, and uh, is all to do with mirrors, basically, interestingly. My hands, the last time I checked, my hands are basically the same shape as each other, more or less. However, 
I can take my hands and put them on each other, but only if it's the the same side. I can't superimpose one hand on top of the other. That is the classic term, non-superimposable mirror images of things. I have some props here. At first glance, these would appear to be the same molecule. If I try and superimpose them on each other, so let's try putting the red on the red, the white on the white. Uh, oh, the black and the blue are the wrong way around. Maybe I've just, he says, putting on comic surprise. Maybe I've just done it the other way around. Let's sort the black and the blue. So there we go. There's the black and the blue superimposing each other. And now the red and the white don't match up. That is because when I built these, I simply swapped around two of the substituents on the central atom. Now I've swapped them back. Now they are fully superimposable on each other. Uh, so, these are an example of optical isomers. When do they occur? They occur when a central atom has got four different things bonded to it. I say things, that's not very technical, is it? Um, there are four different groups or atoms bonded to the central carbon atom. It can only happen with something that has four different bonds to it. Can it happen with a uh, planar? It's got to be three-dimensional. It's a fallout of three-dimensionality, which I think is quite cool, actually. So, uh, my original title sheet said, sorry, that I was going to tackle uh, optical isomers when they occur, some strange new words. Um, I'll leave them to Star Trek. Uh, and went to have a look at some of the properties of these optical isomers. So here I have myself my two different optical isomers. How do you draw that on paper? Well, you draw it a bit like this. Here's an example of an optical isomer. The central carbon atom has four different groups bonded to it. How do I draw the other one? Well, the, there is a choice. You can, you can do it the fancy way. You can try and mirror it in your paper, or an easier way is just to pick any two substituents and swap them around. So if I keep all these lines exactly the same, sorry if you haven't come across these before, by the way, this line here is implying it's disappearing into the table. This line here is implying that it's coming out of the table at us, and the flat lines are in the plane of the desk. So if we take any two, let's keep these the same, and let's swap these two around. So this becomes my methyl group, and this is now the chloro. Those two are the two different mirror images of each other. They are non-superimposable mirror images. Uh, that's the definition of an optical isomer, by the way. I, I would tend to call them hands. You know, one is the left hand, one is the right hand. But let's tackle our first strange new word. These are enantiomers. So enantiomer, folks, is the fancy word for a left or a right-handed version of an optical isomer. So you can have two enantiomers here. The very property of this carbon here, this carbon here, is called a chiral carbon. This molecule has chirality. Chirality just means handedness in Greek, I think, if I remember correctly. So a chiral compound is just one that has one or possibly more carbons somewhere in its structure that can be handed, that can have enantiomers. I think that was a very poor explanation. Just to recap, so a chiral carbon is a carbon with four different things attached to it. Therefore, you can create the non-superimposable mirror image, the other enantiomer of it. So this is one enantiomer, this is the other. And that carbon there is the chiral center, it's called the chiral carbon. If you have a 50-50 mixture, I will come back to that at the end. Sorry, let's have a look at, we'll leave these two for a second. What on earth is going on here? Let's have a look at the properties. Um, of these. Is there anywhere else this can happen? My subconscious is telling me that I've missed something out here. Let me pause and have a wee think. This is what my subconscious was trying to tell me. If we have a look at this carbon atom here, we find it's got an OH, it's got a CL, and it is part of a cyclic ring. Now, at the moment, this carbon here is not chiral. In other words, you can't create the other optical isomer of it. It doesn't exist because this carbon does not have four different things. It only has OH and Cl. And if we chase the ring around this way, we have CH2, 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 CH2. 
And if we go around this way, we have exactly the same. There is a way we can instantly make this carbon here, though, chiral. If we were to pop a CH3, for example, on here. Now, if you travel this way, you've got that molecule, which is CH2, 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 CH, CH3. Whereas if we go this way, you have a different structure. So this molecule, this carbon here, sorry, now is chiral. It has got four different things attached to it. It doesn't look like it, but it does, just in case you come across it. So you can also get chirality in cyclic rings. That's what my subconscious was trying to tell me. Um, where were we? We're going to look at properties of these optical isomers now. The SQA wants you to know that they are um, chemically identical to each other with one exception. So they're chemically identical unless the environment that this chemical reaction is happening is chiral itself. Now, what sort of environment is that? And the answer is biochemistry. If you have a, a biochemical system like you, for example, then the two different optical isomers can have seriously different effects. It turns out, in fact, that all the amino acids for every life form on the planet, they're all left-handed. So every single amino acid is left-handed. Every single sugar is right-handed, interestingly. Just the way that evolution's given it us on this particular planet. Could there be a planet where everything's mirror-imaged? Yes, entirely possible. Um, but, for example, if you try and... If, I, I'm not going to go further into that. I'm going to leave Dr. Borthwick to talk about that. So biochemistry is more her thing. Or uh, Miss McLeod, absolutely. But I'm not going to step on their toes. So, chemically identical unless it is an optically active environment. So, enzymes, for example. Enzyme reactions are the exception to this rule here. Um, because enzymes themselves have a hand. They have a single enantiomer that's going on. Uh, what other properties do we want to have a look at? Um, I've lost my sheet. There we go. Uh, identical physical properties. Yep, physical properties are identical uh, with one exception. So they're mo melting and boiling point. Absolutely bang on for one or the other hand. There is, however, one interesting area where they have a fascinating effect that is very different. Uh, can we see... Can we see this? Hopefully. this. I was going to try and draw this, but I'm hopeless at drawing this. Light. It turns out that light, if you have a candle flame here, or the local star, our sun, the light that comes off our sun actually is what's called unpolarized light. In other words, the light beams are vibrating in all different angles all at once. You can get something called a polarizing filter. In fact, my sunglasses are polarizing sunglasses. And what they do is they block out all of the different angles of vibration except a single one. So now you have a single angle that the light is moving in. This is all very complex here, and I don't want to stand on the physics department's toes. They can explain this much better than us in chemistry. So I'm just going to go with the dumb version and pretend that this is like a series of... Uh, like a comb, effectively. And all these other directions are all blocked by the comb. This is not true, by the way. Go and talk to the physics department. They'll give you a much better impression. But for chemistry, that only lets one through. Well, so what? Well, it turns out that after you have polarized the light here, if you pass it through your two different molecules, your two different mirror <laughs> At the moment, these are not mirror images. As you can see, they are identical to each other. So let's just mirror them. That's more like it. There we go. There's our... Can you see that on the camera? Yes, we can. There's our mirror images. Now, if you pass plain polarized light through one of these enantiomers, the plane of the polarization, let's pretend it started off just vertically, completely zero degrees. You pass it through this sample here. So shine the light through your sample. Um, and then it comes out the other end and you find the light may have been rotated, for example, 15 degrees clockwise. That's what this hand does. This hand here, if you start with light at zero degrees, pass it through your sample of this enantiomer, you can find out it comes out at negative 15 degrees. So the two hands rotate the light by identical numbers 
but in opposite directions. I just think that's so cool. Um, and the, the SQA want you to know, first of all, what plain polarized light is, and they want you to realize that the two different enantiomers have opposite effects to each other. Now, what would happen then if we combined these two enantiomers into a mixture? Hopefully you can see that the two rotations will counteract each other completely and you will have no effect on the light. So a 50-50 mixture of both of these enantiomers is called a racemic mixture. Is that the last of our strange new words? I think it is. So a racemic mixture is a 50-50 mixture of each enantiomer, the two of them. And plain polarized light is interesting, artificial almost light. You don't get it very often in nature, where all the different angles of vibration have been narrowed down to just a single angle of vibration. And it turns out that an, a single enantiomer will rotate that by a certain amount. Are we done? I think we're done, actually, guys. Uh, short and sweet today. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.